So hello, everybody. Um, a massive welcome to our listeners today. Uh, my name is Daniel McGregor. Um, I'm the co-founder of Nexiot. Um, Nexiot is a company that's uh, dealing with the digitalization of the global supply chain. Um, we try to make it easier, safer, and cleaner, and we do that using hardware, software, and analytics. So um, I'm very excited uh, about the webinar that we've got to uh, you know, present today to you guys. Um, we have uh, uh, an interesting subject and uh, it's something that we haven't tackled before. And um, we have some fantastic <laughs> guests as well. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, or discussing some real world use cases around the topic of asset intelligence. And the <laughs> title we have is um, From Break Data to Asset Intelligence. And that means we're addressing bridging the gap or bridging the visibility gap through digitalization. So to optimize the supply chain and all modes of transportation, we need to leverage the power of big data. We call this process digitalization, but as often the case with these words, you know, it means many different things to different people and we have different stakeholders who can benefit from this. I'd like to introduce my guests uh, that I have uh, on the webinar today who very kindly uh, agreed to join me. And we have two very special people. Uh, we have, first of all, uh, Deepak Kumar from New York, New York Air Brake, which is a manufacturer of air brakes and train control systems for the railroad industry worldwide. And they're actually a part of the Knorr-Bremse Group. So a massive welcome to you, Deepak. How are you doing? Hi, good morning, everybody. Good. So Deepak is joining us from the US. And uh, I'd like to also introduce the second guest as well. So. Um, the the, uh, the second guest is Don Grab, and he is the general manager of Triangle Brothers and Associates. And he has deep experience in these topics and also uh, a rich um, level of domain knowledge experience from the rail industry. And he's generally, as a consultant nowadays, he's working with customers to address their use cases and their pain points and to bring these things together. <clears throat> so obviously, um, you know, we've got two different perspectives here today. And, you know, the plan is that we're going to look at some concrete use cases around break data, um, which actually is a massive part of uh, this new opportunity around asset intelligence. We're going to look at why break maintenance is so important, uh, how it's done today and how that might evolve as we move forward with our digital, um, our digital uh, uh, programs. So we, before we dig into the specific use cases of brakes on rail cars, let's uh, take a moment to think about visibility and if there is a gap here. Uh, what do we mean, gentlemen, um, by visibility? And what do we mean when we say there's a visibility gap? This maybe creates some context for our, our further discussion, but it's almost a semantic topic to begin with. So I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, Don, you could start with that. What, what does visibility mean to your customers when you talk to them about the challenges they're trying to fix? Well, when a freight car leaves a terminal headed to a destination, there's not much visibility after the train departs. And there certainly isn't visibility on an individual car basis that amounts to much. It's difficult for even the railroad in some cases to know the precise location. So Nexia technology opens up a whole host of opportunities. Those opportunities include being able to have a much more detailed idea of what's going on with the brake system between the time it departs a terminal and arrives at a destination. Okay, thanks for that. And um, now Deepak, um, you're uh, you know, part of the organization that made this decision to drive forward uh, your digital capabilities and to increase visibility on on multiple elements of the processes that are involved with brakes. What does visibility mean to um, New York Air Brake and particularly to the stakeholders that depend on your products and services? Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Dan. So as as Don said, there once the once the freight car leaves the terminal, there's very little visibility on what's going on. Um, and so when we talk about the availability and the maintainability of the assets, right, uh, to improve the overall customer service, uh, you know, it's important that 
the health of the brake system um, is is well known and it's understood uh, because for a freight car to stay in service, it's absolutely critical that the state of the brake system is uh, is good, right? From a safety perspective overall, and you know the railroads spend a lot of time and effort uh, to really have an understanding of what the state of the brake system is. Uh, they do that through manual inspections. They do that through uh, wayside uh, uh, inspection systems and, and so on. Uh, but real time, that visibility of what the state of the current brake system is, that's not available. And until a brake car, um, until a car is flagged as a bad car or with a defective brake system through either a manual inspection or through wage side uh, inspection systems, the car is taken out of service, there's not much understanding of, of what's going on with the, with, with the brakes. Uh, so that's the current condition of the visibility. And to your point, by adding some digitalization, some sensors, uh, and the ability to remotely access this data about the brake systems can give that much needed visibility uh, you know, to the railroads and other stakeholders as to what's going on with the brake systems so that they can uh, manage the operation much better. So, so thanks both of you for that uh, really great introduction to the topic of visibility. And, you know, visibility is something, it's one of these words, transparency, visibility, you know, we hear about it a lot, but obviously, uh, you know, it's how do we leverage that and how do we create value for that and how do we deliver that, um, you know, for the clients. Now, um, the, the other thing that we have in the title here is, is asset intelligence. Now, when we think about assets, you know, one of the things that I'm often saying, you know, to the market nowadays is that actually it's the data, it's the it's the data itself that's becoming or is the asset, or it's the it's the knowledge that you have around the asset, around the processes, around how it's being used, around what's optimal to keep that asset in operation, so that we can maximize our business. So, um. What does asset intelligence mean? Are we talking about the rail car itself, also the subsystems? You know, what does it mean to people in 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 the in the rail industry? This this idea of asset intelligence. Maybe Don, you can start again on that one. Well, I think it just means knowing, having much greater intelligence about the asset itself about the condition of the asset, in the case of the brake system, about how the brake system is operating. And uh, we've got the ability to get near real-time information about whether it's operating properly uh, when we combine sensors with the Nexiat technology. And uh, not only do we have that opportunity, but we have the opportunity that when it does not operate properly, we're going to be in a position due to the data we accumulate to be in a prognostic situation. Uh, we're going to be able to uh, write the prescription for what to do when the car gets to the destination. We're going to be able to meet the car perhaps with the appropriate parts because the prescription for what to do has already been laid out from us from the data we've collected. And part of this uh, insight is going to come from the the data that we're going to collect on a large scale, and we're going to come to know the, what certain symptoms that show up in the data mean for us. And that's going to give us insight into what to do, how to do it, and how to be fast and efficient about it when we get to the destination. So so uh, valuable, uh, these comments, Don, because this really sets us on our track uh, now for the rest of this discussion. And that's maybe, you know, sort of a little teaser as to what's to come in the next minutes. But um, Deepak, uh, if maybe I could um, bring the question to you about, you know, what sort of benefits can you imagine on sort of on a high level to begin with? And then maybe we drill down as the discussion goes onwards. But what sort of benefits can we imagine bringing to, you know, the different stakeholders? So the users of the rail cars, maybe the, the leases of the rail cars, or maybe, um, you know, the, the cargo owners in that in that value chain? Or, um, you know, who, how can we anticipate uh, benefits of good maintenance around brakes? How's that going to help us? Sure. So, uh, as I said, you know, brake system is is a key component on um, on a freight car, right? So you're looking at the freight car itself, but the sub as a subsystem, the health of the brake system and for a freight car to remain in service and operating, brakes are absolutely critical, right? And so, um, 
you know, from an overall, uh, you know, you look at the stakeholders, right? So, so the operators, their mission is to keep the rail cars running, to, to move as much commodity as, as possible, right? It's, so they obviously have to take uh, the freight cars out of service and have to repair them and all of that, but that's only, uh, but that's not the main mission, right? At the same time, when you talk about other stakeholders, uh, you know, the, the shippers and the car owners, they also want their assets to be utilized uh, maximum with minimal downtime, with, with lowest operating uh, costs and lowest maintenance costs, right? So that's what you're looking for. So if the brake system, which is a critical component of the, uh, of the asset itself, can stay healthy for as long uh, as possible, and we can have real-time information about the health of that, then all of these stakeholders can make educated decisions about keeping these assets in service longer, keep serving their customers, which is their main mission, and, and um, maintain uh, the assets or the brake systems only as needed uh, in a, in a well-planned, optimal way. And uh, th that's what I would say. And, and so this data can help us to get to that state. Interesting. So um, actually, um, you know, one of the biggest questions when you're dealing with maintenance is whether to repair or replace. And obviously, safety is something that's really paramount. Yeah. So understanding the status, uh, the current status, and also predicting the near future and the longer term status, it helps us to make sure that the service is there and it's the highest quality and that the stakeholders, the various stakeholders in that value network are getting the benefits of, of rail. And, you know, we know that rail is significantly, uh, you know, less in, uh, environmentally impacting than, than road, you know, truck travel on roads. It's obviously, uh, you know, part of um, many uh, stakeholders' strategic objectives to increase their usage of rail and so on for transportation of cargo and things like this. And we see in North America, there's a, a huge, um, you know, program which is managed or led by Rail Pulse, which is the major rail freight operators in the North American market who are driving this digitalization forward um, as part of their objectives to, 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 to deliver the value that they need to for the stakeholders. So, Maybe we can talk a little bit about how is it done today? Because obviously there is data and there is, you know, sort of testing processes and there's lots of business processes around repairs. So, you know, what's what's happening today? And then we can compare it to how it might look in the future. You could start, Don, if you like, because, uh, you know, we just keep it flowing that way. Well, uh, actually, I was just thinking about these very things. And that is uh, today when there's a, brake system problem with a freight car, uh, it's little more than flagged. It's just identified that there's a problem. And uh, the uh, information is so uh, vague and ambiguous that when the flagged car gets the destination, it, it almost invariably gets shopped and it gets a brake test as the first step to try and develop reliable information about what it is that's wrong because the reports are so uh, sometimes erroneous and ambiguous. It, with the technology that we're talking about, we had the potential to get the same information off the freight car while it's still moving in the train and move that information to the destination where it's gonna be met. And uh, under this scenario, it could be met with people who have the correct parts and are prepared with their correct tools to even uh, make the uh, necessary repairs without sending the car to the shop. So you can see the whole process is dramatically speeded up because we might have the promise of getting information that's comparable to what we get today after we send the car to a repair shop. So this kind of happened a long time ago in the in the airline business, I believe. Um, you know, if you think about the sort of the the early idea of digital twins, and we kind of have you know maintenance to do on engines of air, airplanes, and we have a short turnaround time. Is is that what we're talking about? Are we moving in that direction that we're able to really do diagnostics and 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 uh, and process planning and we're able to even look at product life cycle management. We probably get into these things a little bit later, but you know, uh, Deepak, I mean, you know, 
at many of the challenges that, that are faced by your customers when deciding, making decisions about, um, you know, brake maintenance. And you've got to advise them and you've got to make recommendations and you've got to put structure in place for them. And, you know, what are the challenges for you as a, you know, as one of the, you know, the premium uh, and most quality providers of these services and, and products to, to the market? And, you know, what's the driver in, in, in making this step towards the digital future? Uh, I think uh, Dan, you hit the nail on the head. Um, with uh, when when the car is flagged, as Don said, uh, there is very little uh, diagnostics that is available to provide the data on what part of the brake system is uh, is faulty. Um, you know what should be what part should be removed or repaired. Um, can something be done on the car uh, so that the whole car uh, doesn't have to be actually taken to the repair shop? So none of that information is available today. Uh, but having such sensors on the components of the brake system can provide that necessary information, which, as you said, can improve the diagnostics. Uh, it, it can uh, help uh, the, the experienced carmen to very quickly point, point out this part is defective, I need to remove this, or no, this is not, uh, and not have to go through the full brake test, right? So it should expedite um, detecting a bad part, repairing the bad part, and getting the car on, on its way. Um, the other element from an overall maintenance perspective is also about having maintenance programs that are more, um, I would say, opportunistic rather than mandatory. Uh, because there are currently examples where, uh, you know, AAR and the FRA have actually mandated that the freight control valves be, um, be overhauled after a certain number of years. Uh, and the intent there is uh, to ensure that the brake system performance and cold weather conditions uh, can be up to, uh, up to the standard, right? But if you knew about the state of the brake system, uh, the health of the brake system, you can then... Uh, perform maintenance on, on those components based on the need rather than making it a mandatory system, which means the asset can stay longer uh, in service. At the same time, you can optimize the maintenance costs. So that's where this digital data is, is taking us, uh, I think. It's really interesting perspective. And, you know, I think that's nicely answered. And, I, you know, some of the things that I've got in my head, you know, we can resolve or we can refine the question of what the problem is faster and um, we can improve the way that we use our time uh, in terms of uh, decision making and deployment of resources and you know it's getting harder and harder to get the the high quality railroad professionals who go out into the field and these teams when they go out there it can be to remote locations in bad weather it's quite dangerous in some cases because they're you know standing on tracks or with heavy machinery and things like this so they can take the right equipment they can be there faster um, we reduce the amount of uncertainty for the users of, of the railroads um, we reduce the conflicts between different partners uh, we can improve safety uh, costs so this is kind of high level again uh, now I hope that we can dig into a few of these things you know in a little bit more detail so so when um exploring the solutions to the problem that we identified you know when we use that data it's to identify and fix something it's to under understand our assets better it's to do problem identification now um the railroads and the brakes specifically are often kind of neglected a little bit by people who are not necessarily in the business day to day, don't realize necessarily, you know, how how vital um, the brakes are to operations. Uh, what's involved in a rail brake? Maybe could just describe it a little bit so we could get a mental picture in, you know, in terms of, you know, what does this stuff look like in in physical, and 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 how big a step is that to take that data out and digitize uh, that those processes. Uh, Don, maybe uh, you've done. You've done. A, I'm sure you've seen a few in your time. <laughs> well, um, first of all, all the cars are connected to the locomotive through a one inch and a one point two five inch pipe or hoses, and that becomes uh, two things. It's the communications line to tell the brake systems on individual freight cars to apply a release, 
It's also the source of compressed air, which is the stored energy on board each car to push the uh, brake shoes up against the wheel treads. This is friction braking and uh, it's tread braking. So we've got those two functions from this inch and a quarter pipe that's uh, connected between cars with flexible hoses. And uh, several things can go wrong with that. <laughs> each freight car has a uh, hand manual parking brake. We call it a handbrake because it takes uh, physical labor to put it on. Sometimes those handbrakes are left on when they should have been released. And uh, that can cause problems and uh, generate heat in the wheels and make the wheels slide. So this can be detected because one of the uh, early sensor technologies that's teed up to go off uh, and already being applied on a prototype basis to cars is a sensor that determines whether the handbrake is released or are applied. Uh, another sensor that's uh, over, coming up uh, soon in the future is one that would judge piston travel. So when we uh, push the brake pads up against the wheel treads, we have a, a piston that's uh, moved with compressed air. That's the stored energy I was talking about. That stored energy is tapped to uh, move a series of levers. It is possible under certain circumstances for those uh, pistons to travel too far, and that in, has the effect of diminishing the braking power, which of course is uh, undesirable if it's diminished below a certain standard. So we could be alerted to this diminished brake power, another opportunity to know what's going wrong. So, okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Don and uh, Deepak. Um, you know, I, I was uh, when I got my first got my hands on. I mean, it's not something you could just pick up very easily, but first uh, got my eyes and hands on uh, um, one of your brake valves. Um, it's an amazing uh, piece of equipment when you think about what it's able to do. It's uh, it's pushing air through different different routes in order to enable that air pressure to be applied to actually solving problems, you know, day after day, day after day in the field uh, with extremely heavy and potentially dangerous objects that are moving around. And, you know, it seems like, um, you know, that uh, design or, you know, it's been uh, evolved and iterated and improved over many, um, you know, years. Um, and, you know, uh, New York Airbrake and Knorr Bremser are kind of masters of this area. Um, what tell us a little bit about that? How that brake valve works, and what kind of data you'd like to get off that, and what kind of data you'd like to get off the brakes in order to improve the whole system and drive these benefits to the stakeholders. Sure. Uh, so this uh, control valve, the freight control valve that you uh, talk about, Dan, that's the heart of the that's the heart of the brake system. Um, it's a highly engineered uh, pneumatic valve. Um, you know, with, with a lot of different modules within within itself that manage the brake pressures based on um, based on a pressure, uh, the brake pipe pressure uh, that's going through uh, through the train, and it's supposed to respond and generate braking pressures um, under various operating conditions. Um, you know, as as you can imagine, handling uh, uh, you know such a long, heavy train. Um, you know, brakes, uh, obviously, you know, on, on undulating territory, you know, going up and down the hills and, and things like that. There's many, many con operating conditions where different levels of braking has to be applied to, to manage and handle the train. Um, so it's a, it's a complex system and it, uh, a valve that works with many other, uh, many other components within the brake system. And, and to your point earlier, uh, it's critical that this brake system is working uh, working well, and and in order for the railroads to ensure that that's happening as they're they're operating their trains, uh, they have uh, certain operating procedures and practices by which they ensure it. Uh, that that example, you know, there's uh, there, there are brake inspections that have to be performed on on a train as the train is going through a mission, like they have to stop every thousand miles and. And somebody has to walk, uh, uh, you know, along the tracks to make sure all of the components of, of the brake system are, are working fine, right? So think about the amount of effort, uh, the time uh, that's put into ensuring the health of the brake system. Now, to your question about, you know, what data can we take from it, right? So all of these multiple brake systems, what by having the adequate sensors, we can 
have a general understanding of the overall health of the brake system working as um, you know, a complete system, uh, meaning ensuring that there's a certain amount of brake effectiveness on the train, uh, which can give the railroad an opportunity to keep running the train without having to stop and, and have to perform these uh, brake inspections that could take several hours sometimes, right? Um, and at the same time, there could be data that we could be taking from these individual components that if there was at a brake system level, if we felt that the brake system wasn't performing adequately, that you can then identify what specific brake system or, or brake system component was faulty, right? So it could really revolutionize how we manage the health of the overall brake system. Do you know, um, when you speak like this, uh, do you want to add something, Don? To what yes, I, wanted, said. I did. I wanted to say, uh, Dan, as you might imagine, uh, due to this largely manual effort to inspect and assure that brake systems are working properly, over the decades, there's a certain uh, regulatory framework that's built up around that to uh, make sure that things go well for the general public. And uh, in the matter of railroad safety, we have the Federal Railroad Administration, sometimes referred to as the FRA. One of the things that's been done over the years and done specifically by uh, New York Air Brake in North America is there's been a great deal of success in the past by demonstrating how data can be accumulated to persuade the regulator that there's a better way. And that when new technology comes along, uh, such things as being so reliant upon manual inspections aren't necessarily still required. And so uh, work has been done in this area over the years on numerous occasions that I'm personally familiar with, personally worked uh, in conjunction as a railroad manager with New York Air Brake. And so I think the uh, generation of this data that we're talking about from uh, Nexiad hardware and associated sensors creates new opportunities to go down that path again. So, um, you know, I think you've just raised a really interesting point because, you know, we have to think maybe reflect for a second about the culture of the industry. And it's obviously an incredible industry. It's, you know, 150 years of heritage and it opened up, you know, new cities as the railroads, you know, <laughs> that went, went west. Um, and we owe so much of our prosperity to the railroads. Um, and yet... Um, it's difficult to drive change because of regulatory regulatory expectations, because of these sort of traditions and and uh, you know the the legacy of the industry. But it's an incredibly exciting moment when you think about it for the industry to have these new opportunities and to see that data can be sort of deployed to to drive new um, you know uh, capabilities. Uh, in the industry. Um, the adoption, obviously, we've got rail pulse that we already mentioned and so on. Um, how can we uh, sort of, you know, demonstrate the value of, of this approach uh, to the market and to the railroads and to the federal, uh, you know, the, uh, the FRA that you just mentioned? Um, you know, is it understood, the value? Is it something that's naturally happening, happening now? Because you know, everybody understands that we're living in a digital age and that we have to have data and we can improve things when we have that data. Well, at a high level, um, what has to occur is that we know currently Rail Pulse is equipping cars with hardware. And uh, what at a 10,000 foot level, what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna have a subset of equipped cars and we're going to be looking for opportunities to compare their performance to a much larger population of unequipped cars. And when it relates specifically to brake <laughs> systems, we're going to be looking for ways to demonstrate that the equipped cars get back into service quicker, have a higher probability of operating correctly more of the time, as opposed to the unequipped cars who might go through lengthy periods of time when the air brake system problems go undetected, but yet result in exposure that the uh, industry and the regulator would prefer to minimize. 
So the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, Deepak, um, what can we add to this? Obviously, there's a cultural element to this and there's a legacy and so on. But, you know, I see the appetite now for, for data and to, 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 to challenge the old ways of doing things. Is that something you're experiencing with your customers as well? Yes, yes, we are. And uh, I think to your point about the culture and how, um, you, you know, the different stakeholders within the industry interact, right? So it's it's a very large population of freight cars or 1.6 million freight cars. And, you know, obviously having the data and who who produces the data, who uses it, who pays for the technology. I mean, those are some very important questions. And, and sometimes it uh, it makes diff makes it very difficult to get to a point where there's a critical mass where you know there are enough stakeholders who have come together to say yes this is important yes we need this to take the railroad industry to the next level and improve the competitiveness of the industry as compared to other modes of transportation so to your point i think we are at that critical juncture now uh, that with this rail pulse initiative with some of the car owners who own about own about one third of the total f uh, freight cars uh, have come together to say, yes, this is important. And and I think in my mind, what it's going to do is it's going to provide enough, uh, I would say, impetus to the technology companies uh, uh, like New York Airbrake and Nexiot to keep investing uh, into, you know, the advanced technological advancements to, uh, to have these sensors uh, into our products uh, and help us design next generation products that will take us in that direction. And, and I think once we have the critical mass and, and to Dawn's point that we have enough data uh, to show and demonstrate the value of that data and, and realizing certain maybe low hanging fruit or the, the more simpler use cases, that will help us take us uh, or move towards the more complex one and, and realize even more value and more and more st uh, stakeholders I, I expect are gonna jump on the bad magnet. Okay, good. So um, there's two phases, maybe you have to start gathering the data or you equip the, uh, you know, the, the sensors and the, and the connectivity onto the assets, we're talking about asset intelligence, then the next thing is, we take that data and we actually improve our business processes, we improve our, our reliability, our availability, our safety metrics, and we demonstrate those to the wider ecosystem or the, you know, the sort of the different stakeholders and we, we get a consensus. So we're on the journey. Uh, we've got the technology to take that data from, from the assets. We have the technology to process that and to create meaning and value out of that data. And, and therefore, you know, it sounds like we're well on track. Now, when we met last time at RSI, actually, in, in, in Fort Worth in Texas, um, uh, Don, you mentioned something to me that I really that really res resonated with me. And that was you said the virtue, the virtuous circle, the words, the virtuous circle. And uh, I like that idea. And can you maybe just tell us a little bit about what you mean by that? And maybe Deepak, you can tell us a little bit about how that how that might be applied to breaks and broader asset intelligence. Don, you said it. So tell us what it, what you mean by the virtuous circle. <laughs> Well, uh, let me start by saying, building off of Deepak's comments about you've got different stakeholders. And, uh, you know, the potentially controversial thing about advancing any technology you add to freight cars is that all the stakeholders may not view it as desirable. <laughs> and uh, you've got stakeholders in the form of the railroad, who owns m much rolling stock. You've got stakeholders in terms of the private car owners, and you've got stakeholders in terms of the customers. I think the way we need to view this, and I think the virtuous circle is, we need to make sure that this technology is positioned in such a way that all those stakeholders realize benefits from the introduction of the technology. The benefits may not accrue to the same degree to each group of stakeholders, but if all the stakeholders accrue benefits, I think then the future of the technology is bright. I think that's achievable. And uh, we start out with the fact that the uh, we have a big opportunity here for the rail industry to uh, leap forward and catch up with its competitors in terms of giving the customers timely information about the location of their assets and what's going on about them.
I, I really like that comment. Thanks so much. Now, Deepak, uh, Virtuous Circle, you've probably discussed it with Don before. Can you tell us a little bit about what it means in terms of your own processes and how that benefits the stakeholders that you serve as well? Yeah, most certainly. So again, from from New Cambridge's perspective, it's about the it's about the technology, right? Uh, so we we put out a a certain technology uh, out there for our stakeholders and our customers to use, um, benefit from it, and and then from there kind of get the feedback in terms of okay, we see what what you're doing here, uh, but you know we would like to do this right so it's it's kind of continuous feedback loop of of building on uh to you know from one use case to the other and that actually gives us um you, you know like a, an ability to set the roadmap uh you know for our technology because um you know and this is one thing that i would like to maybe just point out uh, also uh, is that there is a use case element of it there's a value of the data uh, uh, where you know all stakeholders have to agree that this is uh, meaningful for them. But there's also one other important element is uh, the confidence of the stakeholders in the technology and the maturity of that technology. Uh, and, and I think that's where you know the technology partners like Nexiot and New York Airbrake come into play with. Uh, many, many years of experience of developing technology which is railroad worthy, right? And so mm -hmm. to your point about, you know, how that fits into our processes, right, is that we take the feedback from our customers, um, you know, their pain points, their usage, what they want to see, and we advance our technology in a manner um, that it continues to give them that added value and, and further keep building on to the already implemented use cases. So so from my perspective, that's kind of the, the, the virtuous circle of it is that we keep building on and keep adding that value story for our customers. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe we, we drill down a little bit further. Um, when I first, you know, got my eyes on that brake valve that you produce, it's almost, uh, you know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful object uh, in, in, from an engineering point of view. You know, I'm, I've got a fetish for these things. I see it like jewelry somehow, you know, because it's been refined and refined around its purpose. And, you know, I, I, I heard from one of your colleagues um, that there's 30 of them in continuous testing in a lab. And obviously, you're constantly trying to tweak and improve and to evaluate, and you know you give it extremely tough, uh, you know, usage and and brutal uh, brutal behaviours to, to 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 push it to the limit. So it's stress testing of that object, and, and then you know imagine that we could have you know three thousand of them all sending their data. So all of a sudden, the test lab is extended out into the real world. Um, that we have more uh, data points. Uh, it's uh, higher frequency, the data sending, uh, and it's been used in real, re in real, uh, you know, usage uh, circumstances. And um, this uh, impacts the, the product lifecycle management. How we design the objects? How do we select components? Maybe there's like a rubber seal that different type of rubbers better, etc. Now, uh, you know, when we get into this, the, like the 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 brake valve uh, unit itself, so many different subsystems are dependent on that. So every improvement can then improve every other subsystem significantly too. Is that part of the idea when we get down into the specifics of the of the of the of the technology and the devices that that, that you produce and sell? It, it absolutely does, and and you make some some really good points because. Um, and this is where I was saying the investments into the technology and, and the work we do to make sure that our products are railroad worthy, right? So we, we obviously have state-of-the-art facilities where we take our products and we put them through the stress test as you as you define, and, and that's done in many, many ways. Uh, and it's basically trying to simulate the field conditions and the operating conditions so that when we put the product out there, that the brake system works well every time and and, and for the expected lifespan of that product. Uh, but to your point, if we had real life data from the field coming from, we have 700,000 of, 700, of those valves in the North American market. So if we, we would be getting that level of data back, uh, you know, the field data, that would be such a, an enormous, I, I would say, input into our design process, giving us the uh, you know the feedback how to further improve. 
Um, and, and not only that, based on the understanding of that field data, we will be able to recommend, uh, I would say, condition-based maintenance programs. Uh, you know, coming back full circle on, okay, how is data then get used, right? It not only gets used, to your point, about how we improve these brake systems uh, and we design them even better, but also utilize this data to make recommendations to the stakeholders to say, hey, you know, you are very close to a point where you would need to take this product uh, or, or this car out of service. So you should be thinking about maintenance right now, you know, plan it, do it in a more opportunistic way. So you're not having to take the car out, uh, you know, unplanned, right? Um, and at the same time, giving them insights about, hey, there's much more life left into the into the brake valve uh, at the moment. So you really don't need to, to, uh, to overhaul it at, at this point of time. You can get much more life out of it. Uh, you can reduce your overall maintenance costs and so on. So um, this data uh, can be a, a huge benefit in both, uh, in both regards. Thanks so much, Don. What would you like to add? We're running up to sort of the end of the time and it's flown by as usual. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I really value you, both of your contributions. Uh, Don, uh, maybe you can just, um, you know, give us a few uh, thoughts about, you know, how ready the market is for this. Um, what can the stakeholders expect, uh, you know, in the coming months and years? And, um, you know, how... Uh, maybe different stakeholders, a couple of the different stakeholders can actually take out specific benefits. And I'm thinking maybe of cargo owners or shippers or something like that. Well, the market's ready for it. And uh, you made the comparison earlier, Dan, about uh, knowing about the status of such things, perhaps as jet engines and, and airplanes and, and the real data that's used for analytical purposes. Those same kinds of things exist on locomotives today, uh, in some cases uh, provided by the same companies, but they have not existed on freight cars. And a primary problem with freight cars is being having a source of energy to do this kind of thing. And of course, we're not talking about nearly the scale of uh, sensors or, or uh, diagnostics that we might have on aircraft or uh, modern locomotives, but nonetheless, the time is ripe to uh, reap this data for all parties involved. There's a chance for shippers to know uh, at the base level uh, more precisely where their shipment is and what they can expect. There's an opportunity for the car owner to understand better uh, what's going on with their asset and whose responsibility it might be to correct that. There's an opportunity for the railroad to understand what's going on with the uh, cars that they don't own and systemic things that may be characteristic of brake systems that can ultimately be solved in the laboratory once more data is available. And that's the kind of thing Deepak was alluding to. There's all have always been some issues with, for example, brakes releasing in very cold weather. Maybe this creates the opportunity to get the data that brings that sticky little problem to resolution once and for all. Thanks, Don. I mean, that was a, that was a brilliant. Uh, I think there's some real uh, some real value in that little sentence that you just uh, gave uh, specific examples to. Uh, Deepak, um, you know, your customers, what can they expect? Uh, you know, you're leading the charge in digital rail brakes. Uh, uh, you know, for the whole world, uh, it's not just in North American markets, but it's also across the world. Uh, you know, a significant number of the brakes that are, you know are, are used on on rail cars are all around the world. Are coming from uh, Cobra Brems and uh, New York Air Brake, uh, you know, the our sister company. Um, how far away are we from this? I know that we're uh, you know doing an exciting collaboration, and it's always already well underway. Um, you know, what do you expect to see in the short term, and then in the near term, Deepak? Yeah, I think uh, from a timing perspective, the, the technology is here, and and I think um, it, it's it's a global phenomenon. To your point, it's not just North American industry, but there's um, I would say that our parent company, Kroner Brems, is making significant investments um, into R and D and technological advancements uh, uh, into a digital freight train for for Europe. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of um, uh, different technologies, uh, a digital freight coupler. Uh, there's, and I'm talking uh, for for Europe at the moment. But there's a lot of investments are, that that are being made. To your point, 
um, and and you know we're talking global supply chains, right? And so um, what our customers can expect uh, is that New York Airbreak uh, can leverage all of these uh, advancements and the technological. Uh, improvements that are being made worldwide, uh, right? Uh, not only for the North American market, but for other places around the world. Um, and, and we can partner with them on further, um, I would say, um, expanding the use cases. Um, I, I know that there are four or five use cases that currently are being explored uh, and tested by RailPulse, uh, but there are certainly many, many more, uh, which I would say are the expand, uh, expanded use cases that we would like to work with our customers very closely. Um, you know, obviously um, prioritizing those use cases will be coming from, from them, uh, but we would want their input. We would want to work closely with them and further expand our technology to help, uh, help further this process. So it starts with gathering data, then it's then it moves into how can we learn from that data? What what processes can we change? How how can we create more value for all of the different stakeholder groups within this value network? Um, we're well underway. Uh, I'd like to wrap things up, and I don't want to summarize what we've been talking about because it's been quite detailed and extensive. I want to say to you, Don, first of all, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to bear. You're a very um, you know, a reputable expert who's had so many years experience in this industry. And uh, I want to say thank you for your perspective from an independent point of view. I also want to say, Deepak, uh, thank you so much for your personal belief and for your organization's belief in this in this as a as a as a direction to go that brings value um, it's certainly uh, visionary um, it's pioneering um, we're relatively at the early stage of the journey and we th when you think about you know what we've done with jet engines and so on in the past you know it's a it's an obvious choice to go but when you also think about you know the seven a uh, hundred thousand of those um, of those air, uh, air brake uh, valves, that's a significant amount of data if we've connected them all. And then we start to look at operations, you know, and the complexity of operations. If we can drive even small percentage changes across that kind of volume, it makes a really scalable and meaningful impact. So I want to say thank you so much for joining me, gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the, uh, the webinar today. And thanks for your contribution. And I look forward to meeting you next time, hopefully soon. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for having me. My pleasure as well. Thanks. Thanks both of you. Catch up soon. Thank you.